The debate surrounding immigration is not a new one in the United States. It wasn't even new in John F. Kennedy's time, but as a senator, he argued for a fair but generous policy towards people wishing to come to the U.S. As the great-grandson of immigrants fleeing the devastating potato famine in Ireland, President Kennedy was a living example of what immigrants and their descendants could achieve in the U.S. if given the opportunity. Today we'll learn more about President Kennedy's views on immigration and hear from some notable U.S. immigrants themselves, including Kieser and Ghazala Khan, the Gold Star family who lost a son in the Iraq War, former SNL cast member Horatio Sands, and Black Panther and Good Place actor Bamba John Bamba. We'll have all of this and more on this week's episode of JFK 35. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Welcome to this episode of JFK 35. I'm Matt Porter. And I'm Jamie Richardson. In 1958, the Anti-Defamation League published an essay by then-Senator John F. Kennedy highlighting the contributions of immigrants to the United States. He decided to update that essay, A Nation of Immigrants, into a book in 1963 as he was getting ready to ask Congress to overhaul the nation's immigration laws. A Nation of Immigrants discusses the history of immigration in the United States and explains how each wave of immigration affected the next. It also confronts the discrimination and waves of nativism and bigotry new immigrants faced. But it's an overall positive book. President Kennedy gives examples of all the contributions immigrants made to the country from everything, including the economy, agriculture, sciences, and the arts. He also described how national customs have evolved to include those from other countries and cultures. President Kennedy also calls for an update of the immigration laws in the U.S., laws that at the time relied on what JFK considered to be an arbitrary and discriminatory national origins quota system. This system heavily favored northern and western European countries and limited immigration from Asia and Africa. Making immigration laws more equitable for people around the globe, especially those fleeing persecution, natural disasters, and other hardships, was important to JFK and goes all the way back to his time in the House and the Senate. At the time of his death, two bills had been submitted for immigration reform, and in 1965, the Immigration and Naturalization Act was passed. Among its provisions, it abolished the national origins quota, something that JFK had been advocating for many, many years. The JFK Library Foundation's New Frontier Network recently held an event in honor of the 60th anniversary of A Nation of Immigrants' first publishing. We were able to speak to some of the panelists before the event, and today we're sharing those interviews with you. First up is comedian and former Saturday Night Live actor Horatio Sands, and actor in The Black Panther and The Good Place, Bamba John Bamba. Horatio, who was born in Chile and immigrated when he was very young, recently became a U.S. citizen. Bamba John was born in the Ivory Coast and emigrated with his family when he was in elementary school and is also a dreamer. Let's listen in to their interview. Well, we'd now like to welcome two amazingly creative and talented people to the show who are also immigrants to the United States. Joining us is former Saturday Night Live cast member and actor Horatio Sands. Horatio also has his own podcast, The Horace Show. Also with us is actor Bamba John Bamba, whose acting credits include The Black Panther and The Good Place. Bamba John also wrote an essay about his immigrant story in the book, An American Like Me, Reflections on Life Between Cultures. Bamba John and Horatio, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, so Bamba John, uh, you came from West Africa and moved to the South Bronx in 1992 when you were 10. And in your essay you wrote for American Like Me, you described having a really tough time initially adjusting to the U.S. In fact, I think you described your first few days at school as what you called some of the worst in school history. Days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us some of that story? Um, it's, it's interesting because I'm from uh, the Ivory Coast, 
and um, in French it's Côte d'Ivoire, it's a francophone country. And my dad was a high level banker and we were doing pretty well, having a pretty good life. And then uh, the political situation started getting crazy. So the family decided, well, no, not the family, my dad decided to move us to, uh, to America to seek political asylum. So I was like, hey, America, Disneyland, um, you know, Mickey Mouse. And then I get here and we're in the South Bronx and it's, it's mean, it's tough, you, you, you got to fight to make it. So my first day in school, I literally got in the fight with the guy that was supposed to translate for me throughout the day. So not Disneyland then? Absolutely not. What's the opposite of Disneyland, Horatio? Uh, the opposite of Disneyland is the South Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I think too hard for jokes. You just like drop it. <laughs> You know, in that, as you, you know, your day one wasn't great, you know, day two and three weren't too much better, but you um, started to try to acclimate to the country you were in. Tell us, like, what you were doing to try to, you know, fit in and yeah. know, how hard that was. I mean, uh, yeah, my, my goal after that first day of losing that first fight and everyone in school kind of knew me as this African kid that didn't speak English and was a punk. So every day after school, they would chase me down to try to beat me up. So I was like, all right, I got to get tough. I got to beat some kids up. I got to <laughs> I gotta be cool. I got to speak English. So I started watching as much television as possible, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Martin, um, uh, what other show, Brandy around that time, and listening to a lot of hip hop. So once I, I got the language down a little bit and the music and the hip-hop swag came in. I found a way to make some money legally and <laughs> bought, some, <laughs> bought some cool gear. It was good. I was, I was good to go. I was cool. Awesome. And Horatio, you come from Santiago, Chile, the, um, the youngest of three siblings. So what was it like for your transition to the U.S.? Well, you know, I, I joked that my, that my dad wore a big hat and I snuck into the country inside that hat because I was so little. <laughs> I was two months when I got here. So, wow. you know, I, I'm pretty much, uh, how would you say, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty American. And I just, but in, until the selection, the last election and what happened, you know, I figured uh, it's time to become a citizen. So I did become a citizen in June. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. That's yeah. so cool. What was that like? You know, we have naturalization ceremonies here. Yours was at the Los Angeles Convention Center. It looked huge from the picture you sent. How many people were you with? And just what was that like for you that day? Uh, there was 4,000 people that were were sworn in that day. And, uh, yeah, I, I, it's funny because I had a microphone on me because my friend was doing a little video. You know, he was going to use it uh, for, for, for his organization, uh, comedy resistance and so I had this you know $500 mic on me and I had to throw it in the garbage because <laughs> because as I was entering I was like as we're going into the room where I'm going to be sworn in I have this mic and I was I'm, uh, and they're like well you have to go outside and take it somewhere and I was like I've gone too it's I've gone too much I've gone too far so I had to throw it in the garbage <laughs> oh my god but um but you know the guys were fine they had insurance and stuff but but yeah I mean it was very I was very proud and it I like surprisingly I, I'm patriotic. I just kind of always have been, but I've never talked about it, like my, my love of the country. And so it was kinda of like getting married to the country. <laughs> Made it official. Romantic. Um so we also you guys went on a tour earlier today of the museum here at the library. What were your kind of impressions of the President Kennedy? Did you were you aware of him? Kind of throughout as you're growing up and whatnot. I was aware. I was aware that he was in the the, the boat accident, and I, I was aware. I, I really, really did love the president. I grew up kind of idolizing uh, JFK. Uh, so there was a lot that I that I've heard and and seen. But um, but coming here, you're just like overwhelmed by how impressive a man he was, and you know, considering who our president is now, <laughs> just just amazing just to 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 be in this place where they honor this man and uh it, it is it's just overwhelming how 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 cool not cool but <laughs> how how great a man he was like it's just uh considering like who our who our politicians are now uh it, you, you know you think like anybody could be president now but at the time you know you think about his accomplishments and uh man he was just 
terrifically qualified to be president. So what I get from being in here is just that overwhelming feeling of like, wow, what a great person that was and, and, what, and all the change that came from, from that presidency. So it, it's a very cool building. It's my first time. Welcome. Oh, thanks for coming. Thank you. And Bamarjan, how did you feel about it? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it was my first time too. And uh, I echo the same feelings. I'm like, wow. If I was a kid growing up and I saw him as president, I'd be like, man, there's no way I could ever be president. <laughs> he got to be so brilliant. Um, so what I knew about him, I mean, the main thing was definitely um, the 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 race to the moon and how America was, was in, I guess, in the race with Russia to see who's going to put the first man on the moon. And he was kind of like um, spearheading that, that race. And then um, I also knew about him because there were pictures of our president, Ufwe Boigny, uh, in the White House with him and, you know, uh, his wife, Jackie, and our first lady, uh, Therese. And I always saw those images on um, just Google, and I was like, wow, it's so fascinating that a president from a small country in Africa is here in the White House and being honored. And I didn't know the depth of it until today when I saw images that I haven't seen before. I seen handwriting invitations from JFK to Ufwe Boigny and Ufwe Boigny responding. I saw pictures of Therese and Jackie, the seating arrangement and the gift that he gave kind of got me emotional. I was like, wow, that's pretty special. Yeah, I love seeing um, there's the cover of an Ebony magazine with the First Ladies yes. on there. And it's just like so yeah. cool. It's interesting. She was called like the Jackie Kennedy of Africa because she was so fashionable. Yeah, it, the, that exhibit, it's so coincidental that you just happened to come, you know, months after we just installed it. So really happy that you got to see that. I'm glad because no one knows about Ivory Coast. I'm like, yeah, we're a pretty cool country. <laughs> Yeah, come see this exhibit. It's like, yeah, it's pretty dope. Awesome. Yeah. So President Kennedy, you know, this is a podcast about him, uh, wrote the book, A Nation of Immigrants, and talked about the great contributions immigrants make to the United States. Of course, President Kennedy himself came from a family of immigrants. What do you think about the idea of America as a nation of immigrants? You, know, you guys all came to your top of your fields where you are now, starting as newcomers to this country. What are your impressions of that idea? Yeah, we were we were having dinner earlier, and we were talking about how lucky we are that to to be able to do that in this and just this country is exactly what um, people talk about, like a, a land of dreams. Uh, like I, I got on Saturday Night Live, I can't believe it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and so, you know that. Um, I'm sorry. No, I, we were having the same conversation, and I was like, man, I'm from a little village in Cote d'Ivoire. How am I in Black Panther today? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Such a monumental film. What other country can that, you know, happen in? And like, like Obama said, this country has its origin story in immigration and immigrants. So it's a country of immigrants, and it's all the contributions, the culture, the tradition, the beauty that immigrants bring, and especially that fighting spirit to, to make it, that, that that's what makes America great. And without that um, ingredient, uh, I don't know, be kind of stale, right? There won't be any taste. Yeah, I mean, to think about to think about other countries even more, like Chile and, you know, how that was, there was a dictator when I was younger. And so that, you know, the, the people didn't have a, a choice. So, like, to be here uh, and, to, and to be able to, to do to yeah to, to chase your dreams i mean it's fantastic like people will come in from other places and they and like i'm just so impressed how like i'm, I'm very hopeful for the country when i see like when i meet people today immigrants and uh they're studying at at umass and uh they're just so impressive and i'm like oh good because you know you think that we're all just goofballs out there but there's just such you know prepared people and and uh and yeah i think that when people leave their country they're there's a, it takes a lot to leave your country, and I think that you know that's the the people that end up coming into this country are probably you know they're not they're not rapists and <laughs> and all, you know not in, in the at all. I mean, the people that come to this country are impressive on their own just to just to make that move. So Im, immigrants, uh, yeah, and of course, like yeah, we were Im, uh, immigrants that, from England that started the country. <laughs> As far as like my, but my contribution as far as like 
um, my culture. I, I, I grew up in Chicago, you know, so right. my culture is just that. And, and as far as, and I grew up watching Saturday Night Live, and, and uh, so I didn't really have any kind of Latino thing to put forward to share. But I am, I'm ingrained, it's in my, it's in my blood and it's in my heart. And so kind of talking about, you see the young immigrants that you mass and everyone's like hustling so hard and working so hard. What um, advice would you have for other young immigrants who are maybe listening to this podcast or doing something here? Well, I mean, you would know better. Right? You came when you were 10. Yeah, yeah. I, I've always been here, so <laughs> I don't have much of it. Um, but, but I can't say, I can't say to, to like the people, a little advice is, um, is just, you know, like, it's, it sounds silly, but it's just like, you know, go for it. The silliest thing that people, you know, your dreams are, are, are you're able to pursue any dream in this country. And, uh, and that's just the most impressive thing. Indeed. Your, your dreams are, are valid. Um, if you make it here, especially from um, a struggling nation, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a great privilege to be here. So take advantage of it and, you know, explore all the opportunities because it's a land of endless opportunities, especially if you just keep fighting. So just never give up. Keep fighting. If you fall, wipe yourself off. Keep it moving. And uh, whoever you are at your core, just keep... Um, Keep sharing that. Keep letting that light shine because that's what makes you unique. And and in my case, I mean, I was hiding the fact that I was undocumented for a very long time. And as soon as I announced it publicly, it's it's really made a difference. You know, I have like settled into um, who I am and even a part of my my calling or purpose. So it's not to be taken lightly. Well. Thank you both. Thank you, Horatio and Bamba John, for coming in here on the podcast and sharing your stories. President Kennedy once called our history of descending from immigrant families, immigrants who came here and made better lives for themselves. He called that the great inheritance. So I just want to say people like you who've come from across the globe and rose to the top is truly what makes America great. So thank you very much for being here. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, if I can say one thing, America has a legacy of accepting immigrants, of accepting those who are fleeing war and, and famine. And um, that's really why America has been blessed so much. I mean, it's endless amounts of blessing. I was talking to Khan, um, Mr. Khan earlier, and he was talking about the beauty of um, the founding documents and how they, they're still breathing and alive today. And that's just not a fluke. There's like a supernatural power. And it comes with like, you know, accepting and giving back and flowing. Don't be like the Dead Sea where it's like we're keeping everything for ourselves. But the more that you flow, you know, the more prosperous we all become. So, yeah. Wise words. And from someone who wasn't born here but came here and, and relishes that fact. So thank you. Indeed. Paul. Yeah. It's huge. Uh, what a great interview Horatio and Bamba John were. Uh, Jamie, you know, it was really interesting to hear their conversation about both their stories growing up, you know, Bamba John coming in as a refugee and Horatio sort of growing up, but you're not really uh, connecting his immigrant culture until much later on in life. Uh, really, really good stories there. Yeah, I think it really shows that, I mean, we, people can come from all over the globe. And again, like there is this idea of immigration being the sort of monolithic thing, but I mean, you have these two vastly different experiences and cultures to draw back on and the different paths that they've taken since then. Pretty amazing, and especially, you know, both of them rising to the top of their fields. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it was so incredible to meet both of them. Our second interview was with Gold Star family Kizer and Ghazala Khan, who gave a tribute to their son at the 2016 National Convention. Their son had died while serving in Iraq. Uh, we'll also speak with an immigration scholar, Sayu Bojwani. Uh, we do apologize that the sound isn't as clear in this particular interview, but please do listen as it is a great talk. 
So we are honored today to have with us Kieser and Ghazala Khan, the Gold Star family who entered the national stage at the Democratic National Convention in 2016, when they gave a tribute to their son, U.S. Army Captain Humayun Khan, who died in 2004 while serving the United States in the Iraq War. Kieser has since written the book, An American Family, about his and his family's pursuit of the American dream. We're also very excited to have Dr. Sayu Bojwani here. She's an immigration scholar and author of the book, People Like Us, The New Wave of Candidates Knocking at Democracy's Door. She's also founder of the organization, New American Leaders, which prepares first and second generation immigrants to run for and succeed in elected offices nationwide. Kizer Ghazala Sayu, thanks for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to set the stage a little for our listeners. So can you tell us how you all came to the United States? What were your paths to becoming American citizens? Sayu, can you start for us? Sure. So I actually immigrated or my family immigrated from India to Belize in Central America. And then when I was ready to go to college, I came to the United States as an international student on an international student visa, and then I started working and got a green card through my employer uh, and eventually became a citizen. And that process took from the time I first came to the United States as a student to the day I became a citizen was about 17 years. Oh, wow. That's great. And Mr. and Mrs. Khan, can you please share your story? Okay. Uh, we, we came in this country because my husband came to study here. I followed him and to visit and stayed with him for three, four months. I had very young two children that time, two and three years old. And uh, we really appreciated the way people received us. I am typical Pakistani woman. I wear my own clothes. I wear my culture I brought with me. I didn't leave it behind. So everyone used to ask me, why you are not wearing other clothes? I said, why do you wear clothes to feel comfortable? So that's what I do. I feel comfortable and enjoy. So we became very good friends all together. And that was the time when I really started appreciating the people when get together and enjoy talking to each other, enjoy their culture, enjoy their families, get togethers. So I thought this is the country where we should bring our children to raise, to give them a high education, to give them a family life. That's, that was the point of me coming in here. That's wonderful. Thank you. You know, uh, one thing I'd like to talk about is what was it like for you, Mr. and Mrs. Khan, uh, as coming here? What was the process like uh, from moving halfway across the world, coming to the United States, and ultimately becoming citizens? What was that like for you? Well, it was uh, first, and just a footnote to what Ghazala said. My grandfather, when I was growing up, used to say uh, consistently, that a person is not complete unless your education is complete. Uh, so it was that dream that I pursued, came to study. Uh, but what really made us decide to stay was the interaction with the people that uh, were our neighbors that we first got to know as Americans in the United States and away from the United States. Uh, and I give you a, a very short example. Ghazala and kids had just arrived. I went to the airport. We were living in Houston. I went to receive them, brought them home. We had rented a $200 bedroom, uh, one bedroom apartment in, in Houston. And after offloading the uh, luggage and taking the children, they were sleeping and they were tired. Uh, we closed the door behind us and there was a knock f within a few minutes at the door. This is what is making us decide that this is the country where we want to raise our children. So the door, there is a knock at the door, I open the door and there is an elderly lady standing with two sacks in her hand, brown bags. 
And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, I just saw that you have small children. You just brought them in. I brought this for them. I am your neighbor, Paulette. She introduced herself. She did not ask us where we have come from, what faith we practice, what culture we are from, what language we speak just out of the decency and generosity of her heart as our neighbor, she was so kind to uh, share that generosity with us. Uh, and I spoke after that to Ghazala that uh, the experiences that we are having with the local people, with the folks that are coming uh, uh, in our path, uh, this is an exception. Uh, we have had lived in Dubai prior to coming to the United States. We have had transactions with people of other countries, other nationalities, other places. But America is the most generous and compassionate nation. Uh, such conversations with children, with Ghazala, uh, made us decide that uh, this would be the place that we will make it home. That's great. And Sayu, can you tell us what your what your thoughts were about America before you got here? So I have a more contentious relationship <laughs> with America. Um, although, uh, you know, so we, we were uh, living in Belize, and uh, in Belize, my parents um, experienced once again colonization uh, by the British. Uh, in fact, Mrs. Gazala and I were talking, Mrs. Khan and I were talking on the way here about the fact that her parents during the migration, during the split of the subcontinent, um, moved from uh, from what was then India to what became Pakistan, and my parents moved the other way. So my parents were born in what is now Pakistan when it was a united India, and as children with their families uh, crossed that border. And so they had already had the experience of colonization, and when we arrived in Belize, they were once again uh, British subjects. And, and so I, I have grown up uh, in this very contentious relationship with, uh, with colonizers and superpowers and lived in Central America, which, you know, has been, a, a, has had a complicated relationship with the United States because we are neighbors. Um, but I will say that, you know, two things. One is that I had... Uh, my first memory, uh, long-term memory of engaging with someone who was American was with, the, with my Peace Corps teacher when I was in the fourth grade. Um, and her name was Billy Jo Kukulka, and she was from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And that was just so fascinating to me, her name and the fact that she was from this place called Kalamazoo. Um, and we were young girls and boys, um, and it, you know, we, you know how the Peace Corps works. When the teachers come, they're there for a short period of time. And I, I have a very vivid memory of, uh, of engaging with, with this teacher. Um, and then that happened at different points throughout, throughout my education. And we came back and forth to the United States. But when I moved here as an international student, I didn't imagine that I was going to stay. I thought I was going to come here, learn uh, from the education system, and take it back to Belize. And I think that my love affair with the United States began soon after my education, um, or perhaps during my education, because America in its best light represents so much possibility and so much opportunity. And when I was growing up in Belize, uh, you know, there was just not that many options for careers. Um, I grew up in a wonderful and loving but somewhat restricted household as an Indian American. And being in Miami first, but then especially in New York, I felt like I could be all that I wanted to be. And that, that really is the gift that America has given to me, is the ability to fulfill whatever dream I want, even if that means having to buck against systems. 
Well, you know, thank you, first of all, for all three of you sharing these stories. There's a quote from uh, President Kennedy in his book, A Nation of Immigrants, uh, where he says, everywhere immigrants have enriched and strengthened the fabric of American life, which, Sayu, sounds like something you would have written, you have in your book for your thesis. Uh, but for the, all three of you, in your experiences, how have immigrants strengthened the fabric of American life? One of the things I say that is that immigrants are the most optimistic of Americans, that the very act of moving to the United States of fighting to continue to be here is an act of optimism. And it, it takes a great fortitude to power. I mean, I said that I, it took me 17 years to become a citizen, and that's not an unusual amount of time, actually. It's a pretty average um, amount of time. And I, I'm, I'm an English-speaking uh, person who uh, was not... Um, you know, didn't have to navigate being undocumented. Uh, and, and so if you imagine the, the number of people who have to wait decades to become citizens, uh, that it takes a great deal of optimism and belief in, in the possibility of America. And in my work now, uh, I see how immigrants are contributing to a very vibrant civic and political life. There's been a lot of conversation in the 2018 midterms about diversity. But the reality is that when you hear about these first, you know, the first Palestinian American woman in Congress, the first Somali American woman in Congress, the first Liberian mayor of Montana last year, that didn't happen because uh, our political leaders open the doors for these folks. Usually they've had to really push to get access and power. And I think that, you know, there's obviously negative connotations to that, but mostly I think it's a sign of how strongly we believe in what this democracy has to offer. Kizaru Ghazala, do you have anything to add? Uh, because I think because immigrants are very powerful and they want to work very hard. They leave themselves, their families, their half of their life back. And when they come here, they have to struggle. And they struggle more than 100% to become someone, to bring everyone together. So the hardworking thing that is in a human being, they bring that out. And then they work hard and then I think they bring everyone together. That is, in my eyes, is a very strong point for immigrants. Just a, a, a footnote to what Ghazala is, is, uh, is saying. The spirit of immigration is to make life better. That is spirit in abundance in a community, in a society, makes that community, that society better. Uh, Talking about uh, uh, numbers and professions and all, I give you a small example, and uh, that study was done by Department of Labor, and uh, the poorest counties of the United States. In those counties, forty percent of the medical professionals are first generation immigrants. That is a service. That is a service to the nation. Poorest counties, such a majority number of the immigrant physicians, nurses, and other staff, first generation immigrants. That is one example. Let's take example of the inventions and creations. If you go to Silicon Valley, you will see abundance of the of the first generation immigrants so busy. Uh, two reasons. One, not only that they're innovators, they're uh, entrepreneurs, and they're immigrants, but the opportunity that this system offers them, the encouragement that this system offers them. There is no other country that protects your invention, your creation, as strongly as United States does. So it works both ways. Immigrants work hard, but then there's a protection for them, uh, meaning that uh, 
if you invent something, if you create something, it is fully protected and the entire legal system protects us. So it is that contribution, that combination that uh, uh, has benefited this nation, has made it beacon of hope for the rest of the world. And it continues to be current moment, not withstanding. We continue to be and we remain beacon of hope for the rest of the world. Thank you all so much. Um, we appreciate having your, you all here and talking with us. We wish we had hours to talk about everything that we could talk about. Um, we want to remind our listeners to check out everyone's books. Keezer's book is American Family. Sayu's is People Like Us, the new wave of candidates knocking at democracy's door. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. So that was another amazing interview. It was so interesting to hear the different experiences both Sayu and the Khans had. I mean, Kizer and Ghazala talking about their neighbor who came over knowing that they had children with them and trying to be as welcoming as possible. I think it really, um, when reading, thinking about a nation of immigrants, it's definitely something that JFK was like really inspired by and knew that welcoming immigrants is sort of the best that Americans can offer to one another. Yeah, and you know, I think um, Kieser made another good point at the end of his interview that you know, so many immigrants play huge roles in our society. You know, he mentioned that many first-generation immigrants are actually doctors and nurses in rural areas or low-income areas, but just the the vast amount of roles that they play in our country, adding to its, uh, adding to the economy, to the engine and everything is pretty, pretty important. Yeah. And after a certain point, it becomes hard because it is so immigrant work and contributions are so important and valuable to the work or how this country runs that it's impossible to kind of just separate it out. It's all just, we're all here together, just trying to make this country better and live our lives and make the this is a better place for people who come after us. Absolutely, absolutely. And we hope you have enjoyed this week's episode and thank you for listening to JFK 35. Visit our podcast page at jfklibrary.org forward slash JFK35, where we'll have some photos of our guests from the Nation of Immigrants event and also some documents from our archives on immigration. And if you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts or leaving us a review. Or better yet, tell someone you know to listen. And this ends our fall season. If you missed any of the episodes, you can go back and check them out. We'll be back in early 2019 to bring you our spring season. Have a happy new year, everyone.